And so here we are with our uh, episode with Keto Mojo and Dorian Green now, better known as Mr. Mojo. Mr. Mojo. So <laughs> I, I, we like that. So uh, uh, Dorian, welcome to uh, the Optimize po uh, Your Health podcast. And uh, um, you know, thanks for being on the show. Well, I'm really glad to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting one. It's going to be something to, to cover talking about keto and, and plant based because there's some misconceptions out there that anybody who's keto is, is eating a cow every day. And right. yeah. it'll be well, it's, interesting to explore on it. It is very much that they're two separated demographics. You don't see them merge over very often. So I'm excited about it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, uh, Dorian, what, why don't you tell us about your story? Because, you know, you went through your own personal uh, health struggles and, uh, you know, modified and changed uh, your diet and which brought about an incredible change. So why don't you go ahead and share that? Yeah, I mean, back in 2015, I was over 207 pounds in weight um, on antidepressants. Oh. I had all the biomarkers for metabolic um, syndrome, uh, you know, almost getting to that pre-diabetic kind of like stage. You know, I wasn't grossly obese, but I was, you know, I was getting to the point where I had a great deal of insulin resistance. And a good friend of mine says, oh, you got to give up the white devils. you got to give up the sugars and, and, and the carbs. And... You know, I, I don't do fad diets. I'd seen my wife go through every single fad diet that I think was known to man. And the cabbage soup one is one of the ones that definitely yeah. sticks in my mind. It's not friendly in the kitchen and not friendly in, in the lady that's next to you in bed, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I started reading the science uh, on ketogenic diets by Lustig and Taubes and Wollig and Finney, um, Dr. Nisha Winters, and looking at all the clinical research that was coming on out uh, about insulin resistance and the effects of the dramatic effects that what a well-regulated ketogenic diet can do. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. You know, I, I had tried paleo beforehand and it hadn't quite worked for me, um, but I could see the transition from paleo kind of like into, uh, into a well-regulated ketogenic diet. And so I adjusted my dietary choices. I was testing with, at that time, an Abbott meter and the strips were like four to five bucks. And mm. basically over a period of six months, I lost 47 pounds. Uh, I came off of all of the um, uh, antidepressant medications and all my biomarkers came in absolutely perfect. And I had that joie de vivre again. That I felt like I was 24, you know, and here I was, I was 45 years of age at that time. And so it was a, a profound difference. And that profound difference when my brain was being fueled on ketones rather than glucose uh, was to me was, was, really eye-opening. I mean, when you've been in a, like a carbohydrate fog a little bit, once you kind of like see the, the, what there's some people call the keto clarity that comes from ketones in the brain, it's a, it's a big fundamental shift. And it was also what enabled me to take a look at the Abbott, who is now obviously uh, one of our key competitors and say, why is this strip $4? And so I drew up a list of manufacturers across the road, cross-match that to uh, the federal regulations. Uh, venture can company that would, would work with us and we fundamentally overnight changed the pricing structure of ketone strips by over 75 percent which mm -hmm. enabled people wow. to test more to affect more outcomes and to have a a, a, a bit of a profound effect within the, the marketplace not only um, domestically but globally um, now keto mojo is in 27 countries wow wow so it, it now is that how long did it take you to develop Keto Mojo? I mean, beyond the test strips, but then now the the uh, testing meter and and all that. How 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 long did it take you to develop? It, that it's technology? been a it, yeah, it's been a continuous uh, journey over the last um, uh, four years. Or we're constantly reinvesting back in the company. Most people don't know that Keto Mojo is privately owned. It's by my wife and I. Um, you know, I came to America uh, back in 1996 with a backpack and $750 in my pocket. So mm -hmm. it's not that anybody's handed me vulture capitalist money. We've actually done everything ourselves. We actually use our home equity line of credit to start the company. 
so it has been a, an evolving four-year journey, and, and you know, we just released MyMojo Health, which is a secure, HIPAA-compliant, encrypted health cloud that connects to your meter. And so now that data can go to the cloud, should you wish, and if you want to share it, we're now signing up the leading electronic health record systems, uh, EHRs as they're called, or EMRs, um, that so that we want for the, the, that keto information that should somebody being doing keto for say PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or maybe for epilepsy, or maybe for cancer, or maybe for neurological, that, that data can be um, provided in real time with their coaches, dietitians, and doctors, so that they can dial it into what they need. Because I think most people don't realize is there's a bit of a misconception of what keto is and what it's for. And I think there's a, there's a spectrum mm -hmm. that is there. Like, and I usually go to people who say like, why keto? Well, for the first we need to know the other reason is why that individual wants to be keto. Is it because they want to do weight loss? Is it for type two diabetes reversal? Is it for longevity that they want to live a, a, a long uh, life? Or if we look at life extension, is it, as I mentioned, for polycystic ovarian syndrome or epilepsy. We're seeing it used in neurological for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. And we're seeing it in nutrient psychology for schizophrenia, bipolar and ADHD. So usually, you know, you start as what is the why? And there are different types of keto based upon that why. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, is it are you doing a four one or a three one or a high MCT oil keto, or are you doing a plant-based keto? Are you, there are some that flip, flip to the other side that are full carnivore. Mm -hmm. And to me, I look at it like I'm agnostic here. I hmm. just look and say, Hey, where are, what are your ketones and how are those ketones applicable to you and what you are looking to do given your reason of why. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, quite often we see the social media keto wars. That's not keto. This is keto. Yeah, right. You know, the keto police will blow the whistle and go, and, and I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa. You know, yeah. what does the data tell you? Right. And so we get, we, we get. Know, we get the same thing in, uh, you know, plant-based. Well, that's not yeah, vegan. Yeah. That's not yeah, vegan. Yeah. That's not plant-based. You know, that has honey. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Everybody wants to chime in on that. And I always say, pieces. what are bees going to do if, if they're not making right. Yeah. You know, but so, yeah, we, we, we understand that. So there's the aspect of that. And so obviously, so then it comes to plant-based is how plant-based is somebody. Uh, there are vegetarians that are out there that do allow um, eggs into their diet, that do allow maybe a little bit of fish into the diet. Then mm -hmm. there are the strict vegans that are out there and say like, no, I won't have any of the cheeses because of the rennet that is into it. And so we have to kind of like take a look at, at, at what that spectrum is. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that is an important piece. And once you kind of like have established that, then you can sort of start to move forward. Um, another reason for being plant-based, some will say, is greenhouse gases. And mm -hmm. um, uh, can a well-regulated ketogenic diet feed the world. I'd, I'd like to park that. I'd love to come back to that bit, but let's sort of like just go to maybe uh, what is plant-based keto. And if you go to the, the fundamentals, uh, a well-regulated ketogenic diet is about 75% fat, 20% protein, and then about 5% carb. And it's generally kind of like one in, in terms of percentages, I'm not talking macros here, uh, calculated out in grams, you need to take those percentages and work into macros. And anybody mm -hmm. who's listening in, understanding macros, we can always touch upon those as well. But if we think it's, I think of an easy phrase is a well-regulated ketogenic diet is adequate fat, moderate protein, lots of above ground leafy vegetables. So let's mm -hmm. talk about what is the adequate fat. And then the adequate fat is based upon what was that person's why. Weight loss, mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes, epilepsy, well, they're going to need different things. So let's say weight loss. Adequate fat, 70% of your calories coming from fat. Well, what would be your sources of fat? Well, in plant-based, we could use avocado oil. We could use nut oils. We can use olive oils. We can use coconut oils. So we've already there got a good selection of that. Then we get to the edge of 
plant-based vegetarian, will a vegetarian allow dairy, as in butters and geese? That's that person's choice as to where they are on the spectrum. But mm. if you just switch that 70% over, now you've got 70% plant-based, haven't you? Then add in 5% carbohydrates that we've got over there, which is the lots of above ground leafy vegetables. You know, mm. we've gotten from 75 to now 80%. And then we just have to take a look at what is the 20% protein source. And it's all vegetarians and vegans know there are many mm. different vegetarian options uh, mm. that you can bring on in um, uh, for, for protein. I mean, obviously, some of the, if we're looking in the vegetable side of it, I've got, I've got some, I've got a cheat sheet here that I'm looking down. That's okay. I need, yeah, that's that's okay. I need to remember all of them. Um, peanuts um, have about 6.9 grams of, per, of protein per serving. Pistachios, they have six grams of protein, but they've got eight grams of net carbs. So you start mm -hmm. having to play the, the, the two levers between mm -hmm. protein and carbs when you've got it um, that is in there. Um, we can move definitely on in, do you allow eggs? We'll allow that as being on the edge. We're not going to blow my keto whistle on the, on that one there. I mean, which mm -hmm. is a great food. I mean, it's 4.5% of fat, 2.5 um, uh, grams of protein on a single egg yolk. But then there are vegetable-based protein powders, um, uh, isopure zero carb uh, protein power. Uh, not only is vegetarian, it's keto friendly and it's got a good taste. And you get 25 grams of protein per scoop on that. Then there are also low carb meat substitutes of tofu, tempeh, seitan, um, things like vodka burgers, corn chicken cutlets, and beyond meat, vegan um, uh, chicken strips. So you can bring in different types of, of proteins there. And obviously what you're trying to do is get a, get a complete protein as much as possible. A lot of proteins are just talk about crude protein. But you want to try and mm -hmm. get a, a complete protein that is in there. Others areas. Can, can, can I, can I, uh, just for a little clarification, I didn't mean to inter interrupt you. When you say 70% uh, fat, 25% protein, 5%, is that uh, calories or is that grams? No, that's as a percentage. I just did it as a percentage of looking at it. It didn't do it as in grams, which is what would be macros. So right. we actually have a great macro calculator on our website, whereas you can put in your age, your weight, um, your height and, um, uh, and you can do an offset on your calories to say, okay, I want to do a five or 10% below because I've got plenty of fat on my body. And then we'll mm -hmm. give you what your, um, uh, what your macros would be based in grams using a similar percentage as that. So percentage is one thing, but at the end of the day, you want to take a look at the number of grams based upon your macros. And as your weight changes over time, you yeah, that's should gonna... adjust your macros. Yeah. Yeah, okay. a lot I, of people I just don't want to realize that. that the macros, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. we got a great calculator that can do that and takes all the, all, 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 all the, we do all the fun for you. So you don't have mm -hmm. to get the old spreadsheet out. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll so drop that in the question. show notes. Yeah, we'll drop that link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Yeah, so then we come back to, as I said, adequate fat, moderate protein, lots above those. So if we look at the adequate fat, Part to it. If we're using weight loss and we've got plenty of fat in our body, then we can actually reduce down the, the fat intake that we are doing. You know, because I think some people push fats too much. And I don't think that's really the right, right way because you still get glucose neogenesis. Your body will still create glucose for you from either your bodily fat or your dietary fat that you are creating. So you will still get this trickle charge. And I think that's what, where some people who have been long-term keto, like I've been six years, you can drop down and you get to this, um, uh, the, this, this low point, and then you, suddenly, you can sometimes see your weight come on back up. And that's because you've got too zealous on your, on your fat. So controlling mm -hmm. that fat. Uh, uh, Luis Vilsner of Keto Gains, he says, fat is a lever, protein is a goal, and carbs are an absolute. And so you can use that fat lever to your advantage. So coming back to plant-based, if now over 75% of your calories are now plant-based just from changing your, your fats, uh, it becomes a lot easier to actually do this without the misconception that we're eating huge amounts of protein. And then it comes to, uh, to the choice of that, that vegetarian or that vegan or that 
vegan, pescatarian, or however to say, what are my, what are my choices of the protein? Will I allow mm -hmm. eggs in? Will I allow fish in? Or am I going to use different methodologies? Now, being plant-based can be a little bit more trickier. Like it's harder to, to start. And, and what I mean by that is when you first start, you have to be quite strict on your carbs. And if some carb content is coming in because it's bound with the protein, that can create a challenge of you getting into nutrient consensus. And that's why testing can be a lot easier. Like we all talk about absolutes in numbers. Is it 20 grams and you're getting the ketosis? What is that net? Is that total? Was it 30? Was it 40? Like my metabolic flexibility now is huge. I can do 60 or 70 grams of carbs and I will not get out of ketosis. Mm -hmm. But when you first start, it's harder. Now mm -hmm. you could do a transition. You could say, I'm going to do what some people might say is traditional keto to start off with, because I've already changed 75% now of what I'm eating into plant-based, but I'm going to have a small amount of protein, maybe from an egg, maybe from a chicken sauce or, or, or some other to get me into ketosis, to get me so I'm fat adapted and then wean off of those and make a transition. Mm -hmm. How long do you uh, think it took There are some people who say, Oh, sorry. I was going to say, how long did it take you to get to that point? Like you've said, you've been doing it for what, six, six years. years. Yeah. So how long uh, do you think years, it, yeah. it took you to get adapted? Is it something that takes days, months, years? What's your thought there? It's, it's first of all, for some, it's going to be very, uh, I'm going to say weeks. According to Volokh and Finney, the, uh, Volokh and Finney on the fastest study, they found that in athletes, it took at least 12 weeks to get fat adapted. And what we mean by that is your mitochondria change in your body. The mitochondria change to more readily receive uh, MCT or medium chain tri triglycerides. Your liver has to adapt a little bit. And so for, for sure, from the studies that Paula continued is 12 weeks. From anecdotal evidence, from my N equals one, or we should say N equals two, and my, my wife and I, it was easier for me and it was harder for her. And uh, it, Gemma it took way over a, a year to, you know, she was always very low on her ketones, 0.3s and 0.4s, just on the edge of nutritional ketosis there, because 0.5 millimoles is the threshold of nutritional ketosis, as per Volick and Finney. Uh, but she was always low. And then through intermittent fasting uh and adding in we were working through trade shows and things like that 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 fasting came on in naturally then we seem to have that that breakthrough moment um so i didn't you know you ask that question and it's a good one because when we come back to the why the person is doing keto we don't know how much metabolic damage an individual does or does not have and how difficult it will for each body to do that so there's a there's a spectrum there and then that's why i, I go with a metric test don't guess uh, you can right. you can have yeah. somebody who's going to be the keto police it's like you either know or you know will this kick me out of ketosis i don't know uh, you, mm -hmm. you test the, the beauty of testing is you get this instant biofeedback mm -hmm. and then you can make uh, you know i think of it as the map and compass method if you're going into a new territory say we're going to want to do mediterranean plant-based or maybe we're going to do indian food plant base with um, uh, maybe some sag paneers in there and some uh, ve vegetable um, uh, <laughs> curries that are, are, are coming on in. Yeah. I mean, the question is, is like some people go, well, you can't do that keto. And I can say, yeah, you do. Cause I go out for an Indian meal every week because I'm an Englishman. Mm -hmm. Englishmen love their Indian food. Yeah. And, I'm <laughs> yeah. to give that up. and I know that I can have chickpea vegetable um, uh, pakoras and they are not going to kick me out of ketosis. Because I test, and then I don't have to worry about that, like, am I or am I not? And blood's mm -hmm. the gold standard. Your analysis works for maybe a, a, a few weeks, but because that's using acetoacetate and it gets spilled in your urine, and some people like mm -hmm. to do that because it's very cheap. But they stop working after a while. It's quite funny. We actually have a urinalysis strip on Amazon. We decided that we wouldn't make any money on it, and in the in there we actually tell the truth about your analysis strips and give a coupon for our meter. So if you want to choose your analysis strips on Amazon, you can go there and we'll tell you, there's a long article on the back of the piece of paper that explains to you why your that's analysis funny. strips don't work. But we, do well, want, and that's, we don't know which that's, other people listen. 
yeah, that's part of the body's adaptation uh, when you are making that transition to full keto, uh, where your body, you know, starts to metabolize the the beta hydroxybutyrate more efficiently, and so you're not spilling that into the into the urine, so it won't show up anymore after a few months. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's the, that's the methodology. You have basically three ketones. Uh, you have uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is about 70% of the energy that's in uh, the body. It's a very stable compound. It drifts down slowly in the blood or up in the blood. Um, uh, and it can be bound onto salts within in a, in a form of exogenous um, uh, ketones. Uh, then you have acetoacetate, um, and that is what was in the urinalysis that can be shunted very quickly into beta hydroxybutyrate and back it's a very unstable compound represents about 28 percent of the energy in the body and then you have acetone which is it can be expressed in the in the breath is what people talk about ketogenic mm -hmm. fruity breath if you will um very hard to uh, measure reliably on on the breath because it's only two percent and you're measuring in parts per million they're working towards it, but from what we've seen, there's a huge amount of variability. So that's why blood is definitely the gold standard for testing. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, uh, you just mentioned something um, that uh, I was thinking of a question because you were talking about the different uh, energy. Uh, darn, I lost it. I hate it when that happens. Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. It'll come back. Well, I think you know, come I'd like to come. I'd like to come back a little bit to the whys. You know, we've we've addressed mm -hmm. a little bit of, of of why keto, and and you've got to think as the person the the user listening is like, why do they want to be keto? I also like to think is like, why does somebody want to be plant based? And this is a this is a good question. Uh, there are for some ethical reasons, uh, which I I totally get. There, there could be for some religious regions, which I, mm -hmm. I also totally um, uh, uh, can get. Uh, and then there are for some, which it might be, uh, hey, we want to, we're concerned about greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions and global warming. And sort of like, you know, I, I've read the works of Joel Salatin of Polyface Farm in Virginia and um, some of the stuff from the Savory Institute. And, you know, we take a look at what the holistic farming methods is. And perhaps we need to take a look at it. It's not the cow, it is potentially the how. Um, and in a, in a holistic paddock grazed where they, they will bring the animal through onto a, um, a, onto a, a smaller paddock, mob graze, and then be there only for a small period of time and then move the animal onto a, to a second paddock and they go through in this rotational grazing instead of like free grazing, which we currently see a lot in America. And it's certainly what's happening a lot in, in what we would say conventional um, uh, farming methods. Uh, what happens with that is the, the paddock lanes um, are usually now tree lined and you can use a fodder tree crop so that the cattle can actually eat the trees of, of the leaves that is on that. But they're also sequestering in carbon. And then when they start to stack additional methods like they wait a period of time until the fly larva have laid um have been have hatched then there's a protein source within the in the, the in the cow pap and then what happens is they bring the chickens in the chickens go after the protein and they scratch around the manure the manure then it nourishes the um the grass the grass then grows thicker and longer sequestering carbon as it sails off the roots within that and so what you have is a carbon cycle. And, you know, quite a lot of the studies are done just on conventional farming. But if we take a look at good quality uh, uh, animal husbandry in, in a holistic method, we can look at the carbon cycle. Because the deepest soils in, in America were the Great Plains where the bison used to go over. And um, we've obviously plowed up a lot of them, put lots of vegetables in their place and corn in their place. And we're losing that topsoil. Mm -hmm. So there are studies out there that are showing that you can sequester carbon by doing it in a pastured holistic method and so then mm -hmm. it becomes not the cow but the how and then that's where i come back and we look at the plant plant base being a spectrum keto being a spectrum is where do you want to be in your personal journey i don't mm -hmm. care where you are on, on, on your spectrum i just say i or you are not in, in ketosis which i think is a beautiful method it allows you to dial on 
in to see whether or not the dietary choices you are making are working for you. We come back to that map and compass. I said about Indian food being the roadmap. Mm -hmm. Well, your compass tells you whether or not India, Indian food is working for you or not. But after a while, if you follow the same route every day when you drive to work, which I'm now beginning to do again, mm -hmm. do you need a map and compass? You don't. You know right. the route. So that's mm -hmm. what we offer. We offer that, that guidance uh, instantly to somebody in that respect. Yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and that... even with greenhouse gas, my first thing is, you know, everything I think would be fine if portion were under control. I think the the portions of cow that people eat is more of the wow factor, I think, than anything. So I yeah. think that is, yeah. that's just you're, way out of control. I think if portion sizes totally right. were fine, we would have nothing to worry about. But if, if, yeah, if I go out to eat dinner quite often, I'm amazed at the portion size in, com oh, yeah. in comparison yeah. to what I eat at, at home, which is adequate fat, moderate protein. And what I'm talking about, moderate protein to me might be a chicken thigh. Uh, mm. that's, right. That's, that's quite enough. It might be a, a very small amount of, of, of meat. And then there are some people who will be satirical and, uh, and say, well, is a pasture raised cattle plant based if it, that has been holistically great? It's just done fermentation to create a complete protein. You know, there are definitely, I, I know that there's some vegans who are going to hate me for having, having said that, but <laughs> there is an aspect that is there. Does a cow compete for food with, with humans? No, they eat forbs, uh, legumes and veggies. They can be run on hillsides that we might not be able to do. There can be lower inputs. And what I mean by lower inputs by that, you can move a cattle on foot or on horse or on an ATV. And they're looking at in areas in Australia and using drones. So again, mm -hmm. I come back to it's not the cow, it is, it is the, the how. And then for me, when it comes to plant-based, it's, it's looking at that, that spectrum. And I right. think that you know, one of the joys of going keto is we can have then as individuals a market forcing function you know when people choose to have great local vegetables from their local farmers market they mm -hmm. are voting every single time they spend their dollar of, of affecting change yeah the second thing is once you start doing that a farmer will look at the business case and say i want to do that i want to do my um, i want to do a csa so I get my money up front for the year. Their business case actually um, changes. And then ultimately, as, as, as this grows up, and if there's more data sets that can support plant-based keto, we can also see that fundamentally we might even be able to get regulatory affairs changed. Mm -hmm. You know, we have been subsidizing corn, soy, yeah. and wheat in America. We've had a deluge of cheap carbohydrates of processed, highly processed foods. And I think mm -hmm. whether or not you are fully vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, keto or carnivore, we can all kind of like agree the deluge of cheap carbohydrates yeah. since the, um, uh, the 70s has created an obesity ep epidemic in, yeah. in, in the United States. 100%. And yeah, absolutely. how do we control the externalities of the cost? The cost mm -hmm. of the hospital bills. Mm -hmm. The cost of the transportation of the fossil fuels that is used that we don't turn it, put in the, that carbon. I mean, I'm actually for a revenue neutral carbon tax and now might be some, mm. I'm not going to get too much into the politics between Republican or Democrat, <laughs> but I, you know, I say revenue neutral where mm. we say, Hey, if we, if we're choosing plant-based because of the greenhouse, greenhouse gas, then really we should have a carbon tax on gasoline. That was mm -hmm. the, the 900 pound gorilla that was in the room. During COVID, we saw the clients skiing up. People weren't driving to work anymore. We weren't yeah. keeping two buildings going at the same time. We were keeping one. And we saw a plummet in our greenhouse gas emissions. But mm -hmm. if we can see that, then maybe there are areas that we can adjust and we can work on a continuum 
to having a, a, a better thing. Uh, why right. should we be subsidizing the obesity epidemic in America by subsidizing corn and soy? Why aren't we subsidizing the family farmers who are trying to work at CSAs and farmers markets? Why aren't we subsidizing the food deserts that are in America where people can't mm -hmm. get access to great yeah, and, and, foods? And that, that comes from the lobbyists from the food industries. And the only, the, the immediate thing that everybody can do is make their own choices. And, you know, like you said, sh you know, shop at the local farmer's market. Uh, we, you know, we get our uh, vegetables every week from uh, Green Door Organics, which is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a co-op co here locally. Um, we, amazing. What is it? $40? Uh, yeah. It comes like $43 a it's, week. It comes we in a get bet. It's huge. Massive, <laughs> I mean, right. it, it, for the two of us, it's almost too much. Yeah. You know, and we eat vegetables every day. I cook everything. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, I would like to see back in schools. Let's first of all, I, I think the, the skill set of cooking has been lost. Uh, mm, oh, sure. Multi, yeah. multi generations of people going out to um, large multinational corporations' food. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they've lost the skill of, of cooking. They've lost the art of it. They've lost the, what happens around the table of, of gathering. Mm -hmm. yeah. gathering. Now we're, we're, on, we're all on our social media and we've forgotten how much unity and community that can bring in. Yeah. Uh, and you're being nice by calling it food. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it isn't even that. Yeah. But it is. That, you know, in the, you know I, I remember writing an article at one point and I just love the sentence of the, the dining room table has been replaced with basically the caravan, you know, that doubles as the dining room table or whatever it is. But I really liked it at the time because it is. It's, it's most people eat either in the back of their car or, you know, they're taking kids to and from and whatever. And it's, yeah, that yeah. part's gone. I would love to see that come back. But yeah, I, and, you know, of the generation that we weren't even allowed to eat in the car. You know, you had right. you know, your breakfast, lunch, and dinner was breakfast was at home, lunch was at school, and yeah. this was when even in England we still had proper school dinners. I mean, mm -hmm. not like I can go to a, a buffet line and choose um, uh, chips and um, uh, or pizza or mm -hmm. some other because we, we all know that if you're going to give a child a choice, what are they going to do? Uh, yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> they will make the world's worst choice because their right, brains yeah, are right. fired up on glucose, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. which is, we've all seen the sugar highs. And you, know, you go back right. to the fundamentals. The fundamentals that any carbohydrate will get turned to glucose in the body. It's mm -hmm. just managing that, that amount of glucose o o over time. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm firmly in the camp, so I'm very biased. I, I have a keto company. B, I have a keto foundation, 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, and C, I live a ketogenic life. So I am very biased to keto. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, what it's is the, can I ask what the nonprofit does? Yeah, it's called the Ketogenic Foundation. Uh, it's, its mission is to fund clinical trials and studies into the efficacy and use of ketogenic therapies for the benefit of, of, of humankind. So basically what we've done is, is so far, my wife and I have been able to, to fund it with over about half a million, was it seed funding to put it into an endowment. And then after that, what we do is, if you go to our MyMojo marketplace, you will see that we recommend different types of, of foods and books and items like that. And if somebody clicks to buy on that, rather than us get the affiliate dollars as Kilo Mojo as a company, that actually goes to um, the foundation. And so there's always this trickle of funds that are coming on in. And then we look at how much we, we put about 20% each year goes back into the endowment. Of, of what was raised in that year and that 80% then gets spent um, where it might be needed either on a clinical or pilot clinical trials. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what you see as a problem is there's not money coming back on in because just eating a certain food is very hard to raise money for a clinical right. trial for a doctor or clinician. So what we mm -hmm. thought was how do we have a market forcing function? How can we do the, how give some of the costs for the pilot studies? So if you've got a low cohort, cohort I, I don't know, 20, 50 or 100 people through that pilot study, you can then say, all right, now we want to go and get an NIH, National Institute of Health grant for maybe two or five million and put it into a, a larger cohort because you can mm -hmm. get the governmental funds to come on in there. So we look for funds that is there. 
We also look to try and help um, uh, doctors and clinicians. We were able to donate to the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners to get them set up. So the doctors themselves now have, you should check out their website. It's really, really great. So the doctors are working together as a society now mm -hmm. to, to be able to do that. So we give seed fundings in, in that respect. And we're hoping to help with a new ketogenic school in, um, uh, in Europe. Um, we're still on the, on the final workings on that. So it, it's sort of like just on the website. I'm sorry. Um, so it's called, um, the foundation is the ketogenic foundation.org. Um, the society of metabolic health practitioners is a group of doctors. And if you're looking to find a doctor, that's a great way. This is where the doctors are sort of like coming together. They're looking at what is the standard of care for keto? So a doctor wants to work under a standard of care. And just like we talked about the mm -hmm. spectrum, the care needed for epilepsy is going to be different to the care that's needed for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it'll be different to what is weight loss or type two diabetes or even cancer. And so they want to kind of like work on the specialties like that and look at the standard of care of keto in association with conventional methods and integrated med uh, uh, medical practices as well. So it kind of like brings everybody in. Brings it all together. Mm -hmm. I thought of my other question when, when we were talking, it took a while, but, uh, what is your opinion on the exogenous ketones and, and you know, some of these products that are flooding, flooding oh, the market? Question. Yeah. Cause it, yeah, to, to like, me, yeah. to me in my brain, it just doesn't make sense. So I wanted to hear from the expert. So again, I'm going to come back to the why and let's, mm -hmm. let's, um, there'll be the why of exogenous ketones. And then there will be uh, a little bit about exogenous ketones. Let's do the about first. So exogenous okay. ketones, um, there are several different types. Um, the one that most people hear about is a ketone salt. So they bind the beta hydroxybutyrate, um, one side of it, um, uh, like ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate comes is like your left hand and your right hand. They look the same, but they are actually different. Think about it. And that's what a beta hydroxybutyrate is. Think of it like hands. So generally with ketone salts, they are bound and you're only getting one side, which is this, and those are the powders. They will give you maybe, if you're lucky, about a one, maybe a 1.5 millimole raise in your ketones. And that might only roll for about two, maybe two hours if you're really sort of lucky. And then you might have to do a rebump up again like that. Well, if you have too much salt, it can be disaster pants for you. So I've seen people who have overdone exogenous ketones, and I'm sorry they've been in the bathroom because they've been banging down their keto coffees using huge amounts of the MCT oils. So MCT oils, you can take one ounce of MCT oils, and if you are already ketogenic, your liver will endogenously change that into beta hydroxybutyrate, giving you maybe a two millimole um, rise or a one millimole rise that will potentially last with you for four hours. And that cost is 37 cents versus the cost of a packet of exogenous um, ketones in the form of ketone salts. Then you've got what hyper athletes are using. And we're also seeing some other pre-medical use cases of ketone dye esters. Dye meaning two of the esters or, or, or a mono ester. Uh, it's another way of, of taking exogenous ketones. They get a much bigger rise, lasts for a lot longer, but they taste like rocket fuel. <laughs> it, it's pretty rough. I mean, they're getting better at the, like the juvenescence and uh, um, the ketone aid um, diesters. Human was one, but now they've exited out from the market. I guess they think people found it palatable for the cost, but we're seeing sports medicines come on in there. Now the use case. Do I think exogenous ketones make sense for weight loss? I don't think so. That's my personal opinion. I think some of the exogenous ketone people might differ. Is, do people want, there are some people, maybe you're a pilot and your weight's gone, gone up, you're now pre-diabetic. It could mean you could lose your license. The same thing with truck drivers have this problem that, you know, if you don't turn the account, you might not ever be able to fly again. And so you're saying, I want to go keto, but I don't want to deal with the keto flu. And I want to have an exogenous ketone as a crutch whilst I go through that, that first transformation period. Then mm -hmm. maybe there's a use case for that. Maybe that is a yes for that, for that particular use. Uh, so again, it is, why is the person doing it? 
What if you're epileptic and you find that when your ketones are maybe between 1.5 and 1.7, but you're hitting around about 1, 1.2 all the time, you're not able to get your, your ketones up for whatever reason, that you find that your seizures go down a little bit when you're in that, that role or you get a better flow state, maybe. If you're a student and you're trying to cram for an exam and you want to be in that, that maximum ketone area, maybe. So again, I'm the agnostic guy. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. say like, I'm going to be like, test, see if it works for you. Do I think exogenous ketones are expensive? Yes, they are. If you've got the money, have at it. Let's see what works with you and then understand how, how it will apply. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a super loaded question, but I think it was, it was one of yeah. those great ones. And I, and I think if you had a whole group of us, that, that would be good to chew over. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. I yeah. think you'll find with the diester people mm. and the, the ketone esters, what they're doing first is they've moved into as, as a sports supplement because it's easy to bring a product to market. And then they're going to mm-hmm. obviously use those dollars and, and euros to do more clinical trials and studies to see what is the, what is the use case. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are rumors abound that some ketone esters were used um, in COVID with a, a cytokine storm that was one of the things that would, would drag people down. Uh, mm-hmm. I have not seen the data come on out there. It was just a rumor within the keto community. I'd be really intrigued uh, to see what are the, the, the things coming out in there. Right. Yeah. To me, it, it, like a, when, when, cause you know, I'm, I'm a practicing chiropractor uh, still and, and I'm, you know, of course, bombarded by every multi-level marketing program that's out there. (laughs) And, you know, and a lot of them are these exogenous ketones. Um, And again, it, it, for me, especially for weight loss, as you said, it it just doesn't make sense because, you know, it's your, it's not like you're even cheating your, your, you know, false sense of security that, oh, well, look at my, look at my ketone levels. I'm I'm really, you're not achieving it from a metabolic standpoint. You're taking in ketones from outside i'm the person that has a finicky stomach so i'm the person that you give me artificial sweeteners of any type and i am the type that you know you don't want to be near and yeah oh my (laughs) gosh i'm a i'm not in a good mood let's just put it that way but (laughs) but then there's also a lot of them where there's the red dyes and the colorings and whatever and and it just to me it just looks like this excuse my but chemical shitstorm of you know just an absolute mess and I look at that part going, if I were to have that, I would gain weight because I'd be so bloated and I'd be so just uncomfortable to where, you know, is there, if someone wants to do that, is there a brand that you like or one that's without the chemicals and sweeteners and that stuff? Or is that just kind of with the territory? With, uh, with exogenous ketones, you know, obviously the MLM is very well um, uh, thought um, after you know, a lot of the exogenous ketones, the base ketone material comes from one company, which I think was started up by Dominic Diagostino and part of mm-hmm. Florida U. They had the patents on that and then it gets licensed out to, to the others. So is one better than the other? I think it's a flavor profile and how they do the compounding. Um, so I, I, I don't choose one over, over the other. Gotcha. You know, if somebody was going to say to me, I would say to them that they want to increase their ketone levels I, and they're already ketogenic, I would say have a small amount of MCT oil. It's going to cost you 37 cents, a blend of C8, C10 uh, uh, on, on that one there. And you will get far more bang for your buck for 37 cents versus a packet of something else and it will last longer. But you mentioned about... Uh, well, if you've got exogenous ketones, you're actually adding energy into the body. If you're doing weight loss, you want to be extracting energy right. from the body. Calories in, calories out, I do believe it does matter. That's why I say adequate fat. If mm-hmm. you are obese, you don't need to be pushing too much of the fat. So you can actually pull back 10 or 15% off of your potential macro so you can metabolize your bodily fat for use of energy until you get down to your your set point is it is though it is the combination of our fat and protein together that gives for some the feeling of satiety and i'm saying mm-hmm. for some the feeling of because there's still arguments on this that that satiety is a hormonal release of ghrelin and that makes you feel i'm, I'm 
sure. Like I have been to, like you said, been to and have a massive portion size where they're giving you this this humongous steak, which is a ridiculous mm-hmm. amount for me. And you, you get like part of the way through, you're you're having it maybe with a Bernays sauce, or it might have been yeah. brown buttered finished, or or and something like that. You might have even had some aspar- asparagus with a hollandaise sauce with it. And then you kind of like you get only a little bit, and you go, oh, I'm I'm, I'm done. I want you to box that up. Mm-hmm. Now I never get I'm done on chocolate cake. <laughs> I can always eat a chocolate cake right. at a large size. <laughs> And so that's that, that biofeedback that says I'm done. And so fats and proteins play an important role uh, with the, within that, that realm. And, and getting mm-hmm. a complete protein, all the essential amino acids, is also a key. And I think coming back to plant-based, that's one of the, the challenges that most, you know, the, most vegetarians um, or vegans will know that getting that complete protein becomes the challenge and uh, where are some of the supplements to come on come on into play yeah and and you know you know on that point it's uh and and you know what we teach and what we uh promote is uh a variety of vegetables and beans and you know chickpeas and you know make sure we get our indian food and our thai food yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. so um now the uh, uh keto mojo test meter tests both ketones and glucose yeah. So wh- tell me why that's important. Yeah, so ketones and glucose, and then on our, on our app, it will also calculate your, your GKI. So there's a direct relationship. Otto Warburg um, was the first person that showed that in forms of, of cancer, that cancer will um, uh, likes to feed on glucose in, in the cell in an anaerobic in, environment. So he was the first one that, that, that put that forward. Then the work of Professor Thomas Seafried of Boston College, he's, he's built on that. And he showed that there's a direct relationship between glucose and ketones together. So what he does is do, does what came up with the GKI, which is the glucose ketone index. So this is your measurement of glucose in a uh, in millimoles. So for America, we do milligrams per deciliter. So you have to divide that by 18 to give you millimoles divided by your ketone levels gives you your, your, your index. If you're above nine, you're not really in GKI nutritional ketosis. I say GKI nutritional ketosis, I'll park that, I'll come back to it. You know, uh, three, um, you know, six to nine is like nutritional ketosis, three to kind of like six is um, a, a therapeutic um, a ketosis under three is a high therapeutic value and under one is really really hard to get to i mean you got to really have a super low glucose maybe in your in your 70s and you've got to get to have a high ketones maybe in your threes and fours to, to get there but that's if you're trying to target for a, maybe for a cancer therapy is you might want to do that that might be something where you're working with your practitioner to get to, you might be in severe caloric restriction, like only maybe 800 calories a day, or you might be pulsing in fasting and along, and this is usually done in a combination therapy with maybe hyperbaric oxygen and glutamine inhibitors to really push down on the cancer and, and, and necrotize it. But it's that it can have other uses within it. And we're seeing more people use it now that they've got an easy way to do it, which we brought within, within our meta. So that's one area of looking at. Now, how a practitioner looks at it or how somebody using a, a ketogenic therapy at home, might well, it be measuring glucose becomes really important for safety if you're a type two diabetic, because a well-regulated ketogenic diet can be very powerful in that first week. And if you are on medications, and that mode medications are designed to try and lower your glucose. If you've naturally lowered them by being on, on keto and then lowering them even more, you get to hypoglycemia. We wouldn't want anybody getting into a car. So that glucose measurement gets kind of like important so that the practitioner or the individual, if they're doing it themselves, can dial down their medications. Uh, mm-hmm. Rota Health showed that they could have a 91% reduction in exogenous insulin 
Mm -hmm. Amazing. They, everybody complains yeah. about the price of, of insulin. And I hear the American Diabetic Association saying, we need these big companies to, to change the price of insulin. Well, what happens if you suddenly gave those companies a 91% reduction? <laughs> yeah. I, I can overnight, I can change somebody's insulin by 91% and we can do it in the space of 30 days. You know what I mean? Yeah. Go keto, your insulin will come down. You won't need as much. Your healthcare costs have gone down. And by the way, they also found, I think it was something like 80 odd percent came off of all medications. They kept them on like metformins as well. So when we reduce insulin, we get them off of the medications, we get lower healthcare costs. Guess what? Mm -hmm. $360 billion every year is spent in America on type 2 diabetes, and we could reverse 50% yeah. of that. Suddenly having $150 billion to subsidize family farmers in America? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> preventative yeah. Or preventative healthcare screening? Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I mean, where are, our meat is only 45 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It, for me, it is like... It's a very low cost option because it's a 45 bucks and just the, um, uh, and just the foods that you eat, uh, it'll, it'll be a game changer for society. And th the other thing with type two diabetes is if you get a type two diabetes diagnosis and you're gonna follow the standard of care that's been laid out by the American Diabetic Association, you're just, they're gonna say they're going to manage your diabetes. They're right. not gonna reverse right. it. Right, right. No. This means that when they manage your diabetes, you are going to have 10 years less of life. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think it was the heart, I think it might have been Harvard or Stanford did a study as to what is the value of one year of life. Now, all lives are priceless, uh, mm -hmm. but they try to put a number on it, and it was something like $120,000 was the loss of for, for, um, for GDP to, to society. So 10 years is $1.2 million that is being lost to society with one individual. And today, mm -hmm. over 450 people are going to die today. Mm -hmm. Just think then, if 4,500 people every day are getting diagnosed with type 2, how much of a loss in productivity are we getting from those people? Mm -hmm. How much of a loss is, is of that father and not being to see their child maybe get married or something like that. And where we can, with a well-regulated ketogenic diet, be it plant-based, be it carnivore, be it MCT, be it 4-1 or 3-1, we could, within 30 days, reverse this and support local family farmers at the same time. Yeah. Now, I, I want to say, too, uh, for people that don't know, explain 4-1 versus 3-1. Yeah, so four one and three one um, ketogenic diets is the is the ratio of um, fat to protein uh, uh, that that is that is used, and generally it's the, they came out of the the school of epilepsy. So uh, ketogenic diets have been used for the last thirty years, extremely well studied in the world of epilepsy because. Generally, uh, what happens in epilepsy is your first drug that you use, I think you've got maybe a 50% chance of it working. The second drug you use, you've maybe got a 20% chance of working. Third drug, you've got a 5%. And it runs on the spectrum where there is, with using well-regulated ketogenic diets, you can actually have a greater degree of having that chance and reducing down on your seizures or the type of seizures that you're getting and the frequency of them. So it is for them, it is more about the, they find that the higher fat diets seem to have greater success, but higher fat diets for some, especially for children, it's not that palatable um, in, in, in super high um, uh, amounts. Uh, it's a lot more oil than you, you would want uh, on it. But again, it's, there's a spectrum here. You might need to start at 4-1, move down to a 3-1, then get into a well-regulated ketogenic diet, then just stay in a set of nutri uh, nutritional ketosis. And then it might be that you just need to keep your ketones in a certain zone. And so then that freedom changes as you become fat adaptive as, as your body and as your mitochondria change in, in, in that respect. Uh, again, it's, you know, well, we have the glycemic index keto as well. You know, I, and all of these were, de were designed before the days of testing when testing was really expensive at four or five dollars a strip. So this is all born out of that. And I kind of like say, well, 
none of that really matters. What matters is what does the data set you're doing? What is your bio-individuality? And is what you are doing working for you with the math and the compass? Mm-hmm. And that's how you adjust for bio-individuality. There's a great Israeli study. Uh, I think it was 840 people were followed through 48,000 meals. And they measured their response to cookies, their response to bananas, and everybody had a different glycemic response. So, yeah, you can kind of like say I want a glycemic uh, approach to it, or maybe a 4-1 or a 3-1, but mm-hmm. just because you're 4-1, what is actually happening within the body? And that's what you can right. get within five seconds by measuring your blood glucose. So once you've learned the route that is right for you, you know, the need, the need to test is a lot to begin with. But if mm-hmm. we've done our job between us and the coach and the individual, the three of us that have got to come to come together, if we do our job correctly, mm-hmm. you don't need to use my meter anymore because you've learned yeah. the route. Right. Every day you drive you, every day you drive to school, every day you drive to work. You don't need the map and compass, you don't need the GPS. Uh, and that's that's the beauty of this, because you've learned to shop the outer aisle. And you've learned the way to go. Oh, yeah. And you, we ultimately might have had a, a market forcing function to change the paradigm. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I look at, you know, we, we like to do two dimensional farming in America. But if you look at the forest, the forest is not two dimensions, it's three dimensions. And in fact, there are mm-hmm. seven layers in the canopy. If you follow permacultural stuff by Bill Mollison, Dave Holmgren, and stuff like that. You know, what if we started to design like the forest? What if we started using the, the edge effect? You know, mm-hmm. what if we had, let's say tropical. Okay, tropical, I'm going to be growing coconuts because I want my MCT oils. What am I also going to do? Maybe I'm going to grow date palms. But people say date palms, Dorian, that's not keto. No, we're growing the date palms to maybe plant feed the, the pigs or chickens. Or maybe we will put in a, a tropical pea plant, a leguminous plant, to feed the chickens that is underneath that. We allow sufficient light to come on in so there is grass. Now we can stack functions in that grass that we can plant our vegetables that is within it of those other aspects. We have, and now in, even in a tropical area, adding in our avocados and other fruits, now we can really go plant-based. Because mm-hmm. it's not the cow, it's the how, it's our approach to farming. We have this monoculture, combine harvester um, uh, inputs of fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. And let's just talk about the inputs of fossil yeah. fuels. I want, I, I want to stick to one thing. One gram of carbohydrate gives you about 4.5, uh, 4 to 5 ki- um, uh, grams of energy. One gram mm-hmm. of fat gives you 9 kilocalories of energy. So if we go back to first principles and nutrient density of fats, we can, you know, it's, it's almost 50% less journeys is required per gram of weight to move that product from one place to another. Mm. Think about that per weight. Now, when we have weight and we have volume, carbohydrates take up more volume mm. to, to move them. So this thing kind of like comes on in if when we talk about the whole carbon cycle that is, is required, and that's where I come back to the, it's not the cow, it's the how, it's why do you want to be plant-based? Mm-hmm. You kind of like have to look at these other things because, you know, we've all seen bias in science. So like, I'm holding my hands up. I said immediately, I'm biased to keto. Let's <laughs> just mm-hmm. be clear. Yeah. But there is always bias in science and people will cherry pick their, their data to provide their hypothesis. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have to look at, at, at a change in a paradigm in how we look at, at, at farming and look at three dimensionals with um, paddocks that move it, that the, where the nutrients that maybe are coming from that animal are now sequestering carbon into that tree, which is being used as, as, a, as a fuel. Um, we talk about in California that there's, there's not enough water Mm-hmm. Wow, hold on. Let's, let's go back a bit here. We've lost 95% of our redwoods. And did you know that redwoods actually will precipitate coastal fogs and increase the water by 27% underneath it, as well as the blue oaks? Mm-hmm. So what if we then started planting more blue oaks and more redwoods, allowing more light so that we could have farming that is in between that? And if we're not disturbing the soil, we're not disturbing the mycelial mat that is underneath allowing for that water to be filtered and be cleaner so our rivers will run. Mm -hmm. It is our approach 
to Gaia, it's our approach to the Earth that we can we can change the water infiltration, and we can actually have things that we can be far more abundant in mm-hmm. a plant-based society. So, you know, a lot of people think that I'm this rabid carnivore, but I actually yeah. have adequate fat, moderate protein, mm-hmm. and lots of above-ground leafy vegetables, right. and it's yeah. all ultimately plant-based pasture range. Mm-hmm. Well, right, you know. It- and I'm sure you know we could we this, is, this could be a good debate for another uh, podcast of uh, you know talking about the nutrient density of foods. Um, and you brought up you know the, the fat has nine uh, grams of energy or, or nine uh, calories of energy per gram, and you know carbohydrates have four to four and a half. Um, but then there's the issue, and this is this would be the debatable debatable issue is the micronutrients and minerals and and so forth that are in uh, plants. Uh, versus the fat, but yeah, you know, but I, I think if we look be- at the plant sources on that, take a look at um, Maria Emmerich and Craig Emmerich. Craig Emmerich, I think they have a new book that really delves into nutrient density quite nicely. You know, mm-hmm. he's definitely, I, I would speak with the guru when it comes to nutrient densities. Uh, same a little bit with Marty Kendall, he's another person that looks at nutrient density. And I think there's a conversation that's to be had. On that for sure yeah, yeah. that'd be fun that and, be, and also to bring yeah, in other that's people gotta be the I'd next love one. To, yeah i'd love to hear the voice of your your audience and maybe they can have questions after this and we can come yeah. back again and say hey look sure. at these questions i, I think you know what so maybe, maybe yeah maybe we could uh, uh have a regular live zoom meeting and uh bring people in to watch and and be able to see some of that uh some of that discussion yeah. i think it would that'd be pretty be fascinating yeah yeah we'll have to we'll, we'll, we'll explore that <laughs> Like awesome. exploring. Absolutely. Well, uh, do you have anything else you would like to ask? I don't think so. Okay. Dorian, yeah, you have yeah. any? Yeah, yeah. I, know, you I any... thought it was fascinating. Yeah. So. Do you have any final final thoughts? I don't know. Uh, my final thoughts would be, you know, always understand what, so the, the person that is out there, what is your why? What is, why are you doing this? What is your approach? Once you kind of like do that, decide what works for you. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, if that's 100% vegan, that's great. If it's a vegetarian and then you can pull something, that's great. If you're going into new territory, do you need a map of compass? Yeah, I would, I would recommend um, uh, doing that. But always don't listen to the voices that are out, that are out there saying that's not keto, um, this is keto. Do your research. Right. Look mm-hmm. at the leading um, researchers that are up there and then come to your, your approach like that. It, it's a lot easier. So, yeah. That'll be it. Just eat real food. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely a jerfer, and I just eat real food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not Love too that. much, yeah. as, you, as, as you said. And you know, yeah. I think keto, ketosis is ketopia is the place to be. But that's my personal journey. And sure. My Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very good. And we'll we'll make sure we drop in the uh, you know, web so, w- website website. Um, um, and a you couple know, links that you mentioned. A couple as links well. with the foundation, the, with that. and then the. And then keep on the lookout uh, for our listeners for maybe that uh, that Zoom meeting. Yeah, I think that, that would be pretty interesting to do a live Zoom uh, Zoom stream. So Dorian, thank you so much, and uh, Gemma as well, because I don't know if she's you off so screen still, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is she going to pop she back in? Yeah, we met her as well in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Well, and actually, you know what could be good if you want to do it again? Quite often we do them together because it's. It, it's nice sometimes to have a female perspective um, mm-hmm. on, on it. You know, it's nothing worse than a guy talking about women's health. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, my wife is, yep. you know, my wife is postmenopausal. So like a, a, a lot of women, she's been through the journey. She's a cancer thriver. Um, so she's understood, you know, that that's her journey. And, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and be good. So that would be another good thing. But anyway, Excellent. thanks, guys. This has been fantastic. All right. Oh, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, yeah. and we'll stay in touch. Ab- absolutely. All right, Dorian. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Optimize Your Health is brought to you by the Optimize app, available free on the App Store and Google Play. Optimize combines health and nutrition content with social connectivity. Optimize is a community striving for optimized health through collaboration, motivation, and nutrition. With the Optimize app, we help you make educated decisions on the food you eat, the supplements you take, your overall health, and the impact you have on others. Download it today and we hope to see you there.